thank you guys. Uh, there was clearly a lot of innovation, both from the finance side, much of which went over my head, uh, but certainly from the relationship side as well. Uh, Alan, from, from your example with, I think, the 20 or so partners and the 12 different financing mechanisms, <laughs> yeah. one way to look at it seemed to be like you have the right leads, the right site, the right partners, you know, the right timing on that particular street, mm -hmm. together acting in a pretty significant effort. So can you and, then, and the rest of the folks speculate a little bit on the scale that this could be brought to, both in a city and brought in an area when we're trying to prevent that homelessness in 2015 and 2020, when we know that the task of building affordable housing is so significant. What can be done now, given the frameworks, to bring that to scale? And then what needs to be done, either at the city level or at the federal level, to lower some of those barriers so that that monumental task might be Answer. Yeah. So that's a sure. Um, so that's a way, of, nice way of putting it. It was the right site and the right team and the right thing. I think Alan and I might say it was the it was the wrong neighborhood. It was the wrong street. It was rock on the site. It was in Brownfield. Um, so we had the perfect storm and somehow managed to move forward anyway. Um, but I think scale is important for this because doing it once is way too much brain damage. The purpose of doing it once is that we could do it 20 more times and make it really bring it to scale. So I think it is important that in New York we have an ability to do a bunch of these because doing it the first time is a lot, a lot of trouble. Um, I think as uh, thanks for offering your help on the federal side, Matt's a, our desk officer for the HUD uh, CPD program for all of our home and shelter plus care. I know. Um, I think you know one of the things you heard is about how how local everything is. Even in a big city like New York, people want our homeless, my neighborhood, my area. So that's been actually quite a hurdle in the federal world because we start to skirt around some of the we start to run afoul of some of the federal housing federal fair housing laws when we talk about homeless people coming from this neighborhood, from this borough, things like that. So those are, you know, critically important civil rights laws, but I think transformed into what is actually a very diverse neighborhood, we do want, we would love some flexibility and some a little bit more rope for ourselves to be able to focus a little bit more on a particular geographic area. Mm -hmm. now, on the federal level, though, the biggest thing you could do is the, the proposal to change low income housing tax credit to be an average of 60%. Yes. Said AMI, that would go, that would, that would, so, that would really go such a long way in solving lots of problems because you know the real problem is a math problem. Once you go beyond sixty percent, you know you really you know it takes a lot of subsidy. It just it's numbers. It's it's numbers. It's okay. dollars. You're you're really sucking so much out of the system to do that. So I mean, it's a great goal to have all these mixed incomes, but it costs. But because this the, the low income housing tax credit is so f fixed at sixty percent, I mean it's so costly to, to go to sixty one percent. I mean you just you lose what you lose is so enormous. And you in terms can't of do local 30. resources, because you know, in a sense, local tax, tax credits, it's free. You know, it's it's extra. I mean, it's, from a local po point of view, it's free. It means extra. It doesn't take away on a bond deal. It's all as of right. It's fourteen million dollars on my thirty-two million dollars. Just think about it. I mean, but I lose that as soon as I go sixty-one percent AMI. I've lost, and it's so it's very expensive. Everybody should understand that because when the community says, "Oh, I want eight percent AMI," I want it's very expensive. Yep. It's just very expensive. It's what may kill the deal. <laughs> That we want to do mm -hmm. because it may just not be affordable under the current constraints and it helps us it helps us absorb the cost of cuts in section 8 also the income averaging would be a huge would reduce our reliance on section 8 substantially yeah, a single one thing that would be that would be my wish but to your other point about you know getting a volume going in you know, I mean, I'm older. I, I remember a different city 25 years ago and you know we had acres and acres and acres of city owned vacant land I mean you know, and I mean, it's great. We've 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 used it up. I mean, we built we really built the city over the last 25, 30 years. I mean, it's, it's you have no idea what it was like about. It. You really don't. Um, but anyway, that's a resource that really is gone now. The city's talking about creating more of it by zoning. That's a slow, slow process. I mean, there's not a lot of city-owned land to apply to this purpose. Um, so it, that's going to be to me siting and getting sites at an affordable price is going to be. The, to me, is the biggest challenge is the immediate of the immediate nature to ramp up any kind of volume. Uh, and I don't know how that's going to play out because it's not not easy to solve short term. Not mm -hmm. easy to solve short term. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. mm -hmm. I, 
I guess the word that comes to my mind is nimbleness. When you're working with that many different people, being able to be nimble, move quickly, change direction is essential. And when you're not, and especially, you know, and you're dealing, you know, we're buying land from private sellers. They don't understand our game at all. They, they don't understand that it, you know, it's going to take you six months to do, you know, your pre-development um, process before you're able to put down hard money down for a down. Like they, you know, they're used to, you got a deal? Let's close, you know, sign the contract, close in, in 90 days. Let's move quickly. So being able to move nimbly all the way through the process to me is essential if you're going to be able to bring stuff like this up to scale. And, and the scale is increasing. You know, 200,000 units is a very aggressive and obviously necessary um, goal. And there's some risk taking too. So, you know, risk taking in terms of acquiring the site. But another example similar to what Paul had was, was the federal home loan bank money. That was not available by the time of closing. So, so what happened? So I didn't do the building. We just took the risk. So if we never got it, our paid fee would go down a million dollars. I mean, we'd lose a million dollars. But, um, you know, you go ahead and you, hope, you, know, you think you have a competitive application and you apply, you applied and you, you think it's, it's exactly what they want. They should want to fund it, but there's no guarantee. But they did fund it, so it worked out. But you know that was a risk because you know it's so hard to line up the timetables of yep. all of these things at the same time. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's very hard. Not for the work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, obviously, nonprofit involvement is critical to a number of sources. How do you allocate the proportion of the development fee that goes to I can only speak to my own case. So, I, like I said before, we're 50 50 all the way. So, it's 50 50 split of expenses, 50 50 split of the fee. To me, that's like a logical. I mean, in business, too, I mean, in the regular private real estate development world, that's sort of a, a basic starting point on any joint venture in a business context, anyway. So, so one, let me just add one point to that because, just from a legal standpoint, one thing that we often see in, in you know, regards to splitting developer fees is. Rather than having two entities serve as co-developers in, in their role directly, we actually form an entity called you know, XYZ Developer and have the developer bear the whole responsibility and then internally there's a sharing uh, of the responsibility and the fee. And the reason for that is that when we make uh, representations to the tax credit investors, and particularly when we render the opinions to those investors, we need to make sure that the that the services that are being provided are eligible services to earn the fee. So we don't want to get into a situation where the nonprofit developer that may be meaningfully involved, but, but may be doing things that is not, you know, under the under the Internal Revenue Code, doing things that's eligible to earn the fee, you know, potentially jeopardizing that fee in the event of an audit. So I don't know how you set that up, but that's that's something that we've been there have been a few audits recently that, uh, that have caused that. So it's something to think about. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Alan, you made the point that um, the project you did was non revaluation Yeah. Could it have been done as a revaluation doctor? Is that something you want to do? Personally, I try to avoid it whenever I can, but I'm, I'm going to do another one, <laughs> another one where I'm not going to avoid it. So, um, you know, this has gotten to be cr pretty difficult, uh, this whole issue, because. You know, it's so hard. I mean, you can, you can hire somebody full time to do spot checks and to, you know, go to the subs and get, you know, payroll records. I mean, you can try as much as you want, but there's sort of a level of risk that, I mean, you're just really, you know, I mean, even the GC can't control it really. I mean, it's, it, there's a level of risk that I'd rather not have. Um, I'm doing my best. I'll, you know, we try to hire a good GC that knows how, has a good processes in place. and. Uh, we'll have we'll hire a separate person to, to do spot checks and monitor subs, but it's just a level of risk I don't like. I mean, uh, and and it raises the costs, you know, 25 percent more to build the building. So, uh, unfortunately, yeah. if if you don't if you say you're not going to do prevailing wage, you're you're saying no to some pretty significant potential funding sources. Yeah, so, so sometimes you just so can't. you got to pick and you know. Yeah. Here's another thing okay. feds can do. How about 25 units of Section 8 without triggering prevailing wage? That would yes, be great. That would Instead be of 8, fabulous. that would be help a lot. That would be a simple administrative thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, my question uh, is to Jessica. Uh, the Obama administration is now redefining the affirmatively furthering fair housing to try to 
try to uh, lower the amount of recaps getting you know, racially and ethnically concentrated in areas of poverty, trying to spread more of the battle around. Um, with this initiative in New York, there's going to be a lot of pressure to develop more housing, 200,000 units. What, what steps uh, is the city taking? What steps perhaps uh, are the state, is the state taking to try to spread around the, these projects into uh, less areas? Um, that's a great question. We, in support of housing, we've actually been, in New York, have been very lucky in this respect with the concentration of <laughs> affordable housing in low-income neighborhoods primarily has been because there's, that's where the city-owned land was. Um, the supportive housing world never much had access to most of that city-owned land, so we're much more spread around the city than most people, particularly in the South Bronx, might think. So almost half of the units that we've developed for supportive housing under our program have been in Manhattan below. 96th Street and then the remainder is roughly split between Upper Manhattan, Bronx and Brooklyn. So we actually have a really great track record of this and we're not too too concerned about those issues. What about the statewide where such as you know places in the suburbs like Long Island, Westchester, those areas? So I'm in New York City. I, I can maybe well, Steve look, can look, talk look to look that. What's happened to Westchester? This has been going on for you know how long has Westchester been going on? There's still Still fighting, kicking, screaming, and just regular affordable housing. So, I mean, good luck. And I mean, that's certainly from the state's perspective, is to mix it up and, and you know, to look uh, at, you know, diverse communities and, and diverse cultures. Yeah. 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 I think the, the version of that that the supportive housing world is most concerned about is the Olmstead Act. Um, and we were heartened this morning to hear the state folks reiterate the fact that Olmstead in New York is not going to be about a specific percentage of people in a building. It's going to be about the way of life, which we've always fostered in supportive housing, where you have your own key and your own apartment. You can come and go as you please, and you have your own kitchen, and you cook your own meal. So if that, where, with that as a base, um, you know, that's, that's what I have in my apartment, and nobody asks me how many, what number of people in my apartment building have a disability, because it's just presumed that this is independent living by definition. So between the structure of how the program is focused, which is that it's not really a program, it's an apartment building, and the way that the urban fabric in New York works, where most of us don't particularly know our neighbors necessarily, and it's really about creating a diverse neighborhood, we're pretty happy with how the Olmstead um, issue has been treated so far in New York State.